Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Bob Armstrong. I'm the director of the MIT Energy Initiative. Um, one of the things the MIT Energy Initiative has done since its uh, launch uh, almost eight years ago is to bring a, a series of very distinguished speakers here for a, a special colloquium uh, series. I think one of the very first speakers we had was uh, former Secretary of State uh, George Shultz. Um, it's, uh, it's great to continue that tradition today um, with a very distinguished uh, speaker. Um, I'm particularly uh, pleased this afternoon that uh, we have to introduce today's speaker, um, MIT's former president, Susan Hockfield. Um, it's a very special honor to do it this way because when MIT launched um, eight years ago, it was because of the vision and insight of Susan Hockfield. Uh, when she started as president of, of MIT, uh, she had a number of, of ideas, I know, but, but I think one that impacted me greatly was that she had the vision of starting a, uh, an energy initiative at MIT that brought the whole campus together, uh, feeling that uh, th this was not a challenge that you could address um, with one or two disciplines or even one or two schools. You needed all of the, the thinking across campus uh, to make this, this work. Um, and and uh, she demonstrated not only was that a great idea, but she showed how to make a vision come to life um, by a lot of hard work um, and, and, and driving people hard. <laughs> but uh, and it, it was great working with her to, to ramp this up. So it, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Susan Hockfield, who will introduce the speaker. What is the saying? When I say um, I, I mean you, and when I say we, I mean they. Uh, you know, the reason the Energy Initiative took off was because of Bob's very, very hard work. And uh, together with Ernie Moniz, we were able to put together an initiative that really was the hopes and dreams of everyone I talked to when I first arrived at MIT. I did not bring the idea of the Energy Initiative with me. It emerged out of my conversations with the students, faculty, staff, and alumni of MIT. Um, and I was thrilled to be able to be part of the event today and get a chance to welcome our colleagues from Switzerland for a discussion of policies and technologies to accelerate the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. Um, you know, this is the theme of the Energy Initiative. Uh, Bob and Ernie together uh, were very clear in articulating MIT's Energy Initiative that it couldn't simply be a dream of a leap to a future that we could only vaguely imagine, but we had to actually map out step by step how we would get there, how we would improve our current energy use uh, to make them more uh, sustainable as the same time as we were developing those great alternative energy dreams that we have of the distant future. Um, it's um, fun for me to be here today because I've just returned from Switzerland, a little uh, trip that allowed me once again to see the commitment of the Swiss government, the Swiss people, to energy efficiency and energy sustainability. Um, it's always a little sobering to come back to the United States or even just to read the news when you're, of what's going on in the United States and in Washington when you're in Switzerland. You wonder whether we can get anything done of the sort that we, I saw all over Switzerland. Um, there is a pervasive and acute awareness of energy efficiency. Everywhere you look, there is low energy lighting. I don't think I saw a single incandescent bulb the entire time I was there. I confess to having one or two in my home. But and we all do. Um, there are renewables everywhere. Um, you know, there was no city I was in where there wasn't a celebration of energy of elect electric vehicles, and many really hot electric cars on display. Um, there are smart systems everywhere. The kind of sensor-mediated energy efficiency that is everywhere in Switzerland we hardly encounter in the United States. Escalators that stop when there isn't anyone on them. Uh, response of lighting, heat, and cooling uh, to the presence of people in a uh, room or an office, truly extraordinary. And of course, uh, we see photographs of the solar panels everywhere. You know, we've become fond of showing pictures of uh, farm fields that have been seeded with solar panels. Uh, well, you certainly see solar panels in every available space uh, throughout Switzerland. But as we know very well here that great technology by itself is insufficient. Great technology has to be paired with great policy in order for change to happen. And clearly, Switzerland has worked very carefully both sides of this duality and has um, uh, really 
married great new technology with great new policy. And we have, over the last several years, benefited from discussions with our Swiss colleagues and um, in understanding how to actually move forward with energy, new energy technology through great uh, energy policy. So um, our conversation today takes place in the context of ongoing challenges around um, changing the energy equation. I would simply reflect that there is a continuing post-Fukushima pressure on nuclear power. Um, I myself think that nuclear power has to be part of a solution for a sustainable energy future, and yet um, the stepping back from a commitment to nuclear power remains very much in conversation and in practice uh, in Europe. Um, there is the perpetual escalation of instability in gas and oil supplies. Russia is once again threatening to withdraw supplies from countries that don't meet their political um, uh, goals. Uh, the politics of Iraq and other oil-producing countries continues to grow complex. And um, Germany's recent statement of withdrawing from hydraulic fracking as a source of oil and gas um, I would say requires some kind of discussion, uh, particularly since they have prosecuted these kinds of resources quite successfully and safely in the past. And I would simply say, you know, my own view is the solution to these problems cannot be a return to dependence on coal, which is in fact what we are seeing in many places around the world. So it is an opportune time for this afternoon's discussion. And it is a particular pleasure to introduce uh, Federal Counsel Doris Leutard for her second or is it your third visit to, visit to MIT. She's a perpetual visitor here. We're happy to have her. She is one of seven federal uh, counselors in Switzerland. That is Switzerland's cabinet. She heads the Federal Department of the Environment, Transport, Energy, and Communications, DTEC was having a conversation with my daughter this afternoon, and I described your portfolio, and she said, is there anyone else who does anything in Switzerland? She felt that you would, and I said, well, she's a woman, she can do it all. Um, in 2010, she served as president of the Swiss Confederation, and has done an enormous amount to help Switzerland move along this very important dual axis of uh, sustainable technology and also the policy to support it. It's a great joy to welcome her back to MIT, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to hearing her and her colleagues' reflections on the future energy supply and security in Switzerland. I have with me a small gift for you. It is a um, glass art object manufactured, manufactured, made by hand in the MIT glass lab, and it's just a small token of our appreciation for our collegiality, our collaboration, and our hope for ongoing work between MIT and Switzerland. Please, Councillor. Hello, Susan, Vice President of MIT, Director of MIT, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. It's all my pleasure being back to MIT again and having the opportunity to discuss with you about uh, some elements which we all care about. And you see on this picture the Matterhorn, because in Switzerland it has a lot to do with the Alps. Water in our Alps are, are something we produce hydropower, we have the storage in the Alpine region, but we see also the melting glaciers, and we see also more disaster risks, risks arriving from climate change. So when you're uh, living in Alpine region, actually, you don't doubt we have climate change, and you see we have to move away from fossil fuels. So. I'm here also because I think uh, what Susan Hockfield uh, with this energy initiative created is purely uh, uh, part of my uh, uh, today's work because my uh, ministry with uh, the responsibility for environment, for energy, for communication, also for spatial planning reflects also your idea that we have to work together in an interdisciplinary way 
that we have to combine uh, the issues on transportation, on energy, electricity supply, on the environment, and that's why uh, we in my uh, ministry are very interlinked together. We lift this interdisciplinarity to uh, prepare a decent legal framework where the uh, economy and scientists afterwards have to bring us to solutions. We are convinced we have to do more than dream. We have to act. We have to do more than study. We have to understand. We have to do more than to try. We have to do it. My MIT is therefore for me a perfect place to do all of this, as indeed are the ETH and EPFL in Switzerland, federal institutes of also a high quality uh, on the globe. The MIT is for us also a perfect place to push dialogue and collaboration towards a greener technological development. First, it's because Boston, just on the other side of the Charles River, is one of the most active clean energy hubs in North America. I think it works like this. Because Switzerland and Massachusetts share a vision for a more sustainable future with a reduced carbon footprint, increased resiliency, and a lower dependency on non-sustainable energy sources. And third, because MIT and Switzerland's Federal Institutes of Technology are ranked among the best universities in the world. According to the World Energy Outlook of the IEA, global demand for energy will increase by 60% by 2035. The ability to produce energy at affordable prices is a decisive factor for a modern economy which is, why, which, is afford, which is consistent improvements for energy efficiency, the expansion of uh, new, renewable energies and energy security are all on the agenda over the world of all responsible politicians. Given that it is a country with few natural resources, Switzerland has been striving to make the most efficient use of resources for a long time, for compelling reasons. We have no oil, no gas, no fracking, no uh, 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 other uh, resources besides water. We import around 80% of our energy. But we can use water which covers around 56% of power needs. That's why in 2010, the Swiss government drafted an agenda to green our economy, to be more resource efficient, and to reduce our CO2 emissions. If we want to contribute to a prosperous world economy which can feed 9 billion people, giving them access to clean water, to transport, and to electricity, we need change. A change in a way of our thinking, a way of our behavior, and if we act, changes in technology, changes in financial allocations, and in subsidies. That's why we are also following the geopolitical shifts on the global energy map with great interest. We see how China and India are becoming the world's largest importers of oil and coal, but also the world's largest emitters of CO2. We see that the US will soon be able to cover its own energy needs thanks to the discovery of new gas fields and the fracking of shale gas that coal is exported to Europe and that uh, sooner or later you will also export your gas towards other countries. We note with some concern the developments in Ukraine especially given that the region is of key importance for the whole of Europe in terms of energy supply. Energy generation and supply are important, but let's first talk about energy consumption, the demand side. It is vital that we in industrialized countries reduce our energy consumption. Oops, you see here uh, 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 the consumption of resources by region. You see the Northern American regions are ahead of 
every other state. Yes, I, I had to talk this also in Washington because you only talk about how fast you reduce your CO2 emissions, how fast you reduce all other resources, but it's a fact you're reducing from a very, very high uh, uh, niveau. So that's, I think, uh, something we have to care about. Today, 20% of the world population consumes 80% of our energy. According to the IEA estimates, the 2.2 billion inhabitants of the underdeveloped countries use up to 35 times less electricity than the 1.3 billion inhabitants of industrialized countries. There are currently 900 million, million cars in the world. Of those, 235 million are driven in the US and 10% of those are in Los Angeles. If that pattern was to be followed all over the world, also by all these underdeveloped countries, by transition countries, I think we would be in big trouble because then we would be around five billion cars on our roads, which consume energy. We therefore have to take steps to reduce our carbon footprint in transport and traffic, in buildings, in heating, cooling systems, and in the industry. That is where the greatest potential lies for reducing consumption and boosting efficiency. We see here a global, global market assessment for the volume for clean tech, clean energy in the upcoming years. So innovations in the energy sector and in energy technology are becoming increasingly important. Both high-tech and traditional industries are affected by these trends. They can all see the push for an efficiency revolution as an opportunity. The greatest potential for market dynamism is expected in the re renewable energy and material efficiency sectors. If we don't manage to come up with smart solutions, future generation will, as a result, suffer from our actions, or rather, our inaction. New sources of energy production and new energy efficiency technologies must therefore be an essential part of our policy of today. At the same time, such policies should draw us away from high levels of fossil fuel consumption and the associated CO2 emissions. As far as efficiency in buildings, in public transportation and in industry are concerned, Switzerland is among the leading nations in innovation and competitiveness according to various performance indexes and rankings, especially in the clean tech sector. And because it's worth going in this direction, you see here business opportunities. We think this should be also an example for the United States. You see here a few examples uh, why Switzerland ranks top of the top. We have the WEF ranking of competitiveness. We have a ranking of green and competitive economy where Switzerland is ranked first. We have the Innovation Union scoreboard where Switzerland is ranked first. We have the World Energy Council's Energy Sustainability Index, where Switzerland is ranked first. We have the Yale Environmental Performance Index, where Switzerland is ranked first, and so on. I'm proud of that, clear. But I think it's also, it's, it's a lot of work behind that in the close cooperation with science, with industry, with, which brings us to this level of performance. The excellent performance has been made possibly mostly thanks to our excellent researchers in industry in, uh, and in academic institutions. And thanks to the financial support of the Swiss government, uh, I think we also take our part of this success story. But Switzerland is small. We are not relevant for the global emissions. We are not relevant for the global fossil fuel consumption. We are not relevant for other scarcity of resources. We just can be a role model, a, con a partner, and bring uh, uh, commercial industrial solutions to other countries. 
considering the willingness on the part of our researchers and engineers to search for new answers, I'm convinced that we will find more smart and marketable solutions to our common energy challenges. I know that Massachusetts is one of the most advanced states in terms of R&D. Switzerland is therefore an excellent match to tackle these challenges together. Switzerland is already one of the biggest foreign R&D investors in the US and half of all fellows of the Swiss National Science Foundation drawn to the US for work. Cooperation between our universities is already strong and it could even grow more. And I think this visit will again give us new impetus. By way of example, the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich and Lausanne share the same DNA as MIT. There are 73 bilateral links on an informal basis between ETH and MIT. The signing of the ETI-MIT student exchange agreement uh, one hour before is the way forward. I could mention many more, but I would rather hope that we foster even more new part partnerships on together in these days. Working together, Swiss and Americans can be a powerful driver towards global cooperation on climate and energy policy. But for what we need, joined up research and joined up markets. For me, it's always very important that we have the whole picture of energy. And in a lot of countries I see, either you care about production or efficiency or the grid, but actually you must have a thinking and a, a coherent policy which includes all elements of uh, uh, energy from the production through the transportation to the consumer, also to the storage or recycling of elements. For that, we need joined up research and joined up markets. Only then, and via IT-steered infrastructure, can energy reach the consumer in a way that makes efficient use of resources. A worldwide energy web is my idea. A worldwide energy web could be uh, part of our common cooperation. For that, we are dependent on international intelligence in both senses of the world. Intelligence in terms of R&D and intelligence in terms of IT solutions. For production, transmission and consumption, have to be optimally integrated by making full use, on, full use of available global IT resources. The human being sometimes is a little bit lazy. By IT, I think we can help him to be and live the most efficient way which is possible. Particularly in terms of energy supply, conditions are set to continue changing in the future. That requires flexibility in politics, flexibility in business, and especially in research. We need answers to host of difficult questions. How do we put in place incentives to save energy and reduce consumption, particularly in our societies, when energy remains so cheap and their interest to be more efficient is therefore very low? How can we, di can we divert the over 550 billion US dollars in fossil fuel subsidies? Would be worth to have a part of this money in efficiency or in renewables? How can we improve energy storage and minimize trans transmission losses in the grid? How can increasing mobility, particularly in megacities, be achieved using less energy, less space, and lower emissions. The job of political actors in the rapidly changing environment of energy technologies is not easy. Legislation is already lagging behind market innovations. The questions of data protection in new intelligent networks is just one example. Who does the data belong to? Who is allowed to use it and for what purpose? 
the energy industry and all those involved in have to wake up and get used to the idea over the next 10 years that it will not be possible to immediately regulate every innovation. That can also be seen as an opportunity, especially in terms of research and market competition. We have two main goals to achieve, regardless of short-term economic wishes, regardless of the current state of the economy, and regardless of whether we are talking about industrial, emerging, or developing countries. Firstly, the share of fossil fuels must be brought down because these resources are finite and because many people on this planet are consuming ever more energy. And secondly, global warming must be contained. The time for grand declarations is over. The world needs stalwart policies and politicians who keep their campaign promises. I expressly welcome, therefore, the Green Power Plan, the Green Climate Plan presented by President Obama. What Silicon Valley has done for IT over the last 40, 50 years, universities such as MIT must do for energy, energy technologies now. A pace for inventors, a place for visionaries. Create synergies, make the most of your networks, show through your research too how important it is to push education. Because even MIT's best won't be able to put the world on the energy path of the, of the future on their own. It is vital that information and communication technologies are incorporated into energy production, transmission, and consumption at all levels. From the electricity meter in the home to power station turbines, every part of the network must be embedded in a common system. Soon, Google, by buying up sensor and power management firms in the building system sector, will be able to determine who is most likely to be at home, when to take delivery of parcels, what and when you are consuming electricity. Smart networks fed by thousands of energy sources and used by thousands of consumers, similar to the internet. A long-term goal such as that code, uh, such as that could lead to great efficiency gains. And I think these are low-hanging fruits for uh, very intelligent people, researchers like you. But there is a need for more ICT to manage the increasingly volatile means of production. In its Green Revolution paper, the European Network of Transmission System Operators expect to see an expansion of up to 60% in renewable energies by 2030. That will call for flexibility in production and on the grid. And for that, we need research researchers again. In Switzerland, we currently have two national research programs which aim to point the way towards technological developments for a sustainable energy policy. We, will, we would like with that, having in parallel to uh, enlarge the academia, the scientific knowledge, and implement a fast track to uh, having uh, uh, results in uh, uh, the machine industry, in the chemical industry, in the uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry. For that, we have researchers. Professor Gretzel, for example, from the EPFL Lausanne, has successfully put into practice the principle of photosynthesis in solar cells. Professor Steinfeld from the ETH Zurich has, together with the California Institute of Technology, managed to generate solar fuel from water and carbon dioxide with the help of concentrated sunlight. The quest for perpetual motion is not only 
being conducted by scientists in the US and France, but also by the fusion scientist Ming Chang Tran from EPF Lausanne. You see, ladies and gentlemen, shaping the world of tomorrow needs uh, thinking, needs another approach towards a greener economy. It is our job to help cultivate innovation and ensure that the best and brightest ideas go from the laboratory to the marketplace. We must take sure we invest in the next generation of cutting edge technologies and lead the way in clean energy research and innovation. A lot of emerging countries don't have neither the technologies nor the money for that. So I think research and we as industrial countries have also responsibility to help them. We reduce our footprints, they will rise their footprints, but we have to meet in between in a way that the resources from this one planet we have are sufficient for everybody. Today's innovative technologies will shape our future. Switzerland is convinced of that, and that's why we share with you the idea of partnership, of collaboration between politicians, the economy, and science. So, therefore, I wish you good luck with your valuable work, and hope you bring us the solutions. I can just talk about it. I can just help that the legal framework and the money is here, but the work and the ideas, that's your job. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
And therefore, I think uh, to reduce CO2 emissions or to reduce fossil fuels, uh, I think it's not a question if it's wrong or right. We have to do it. So I think uh, uh, storage you mentioned it will be one of the... Uh, I think this will, this will get for the Nobel Prize <laughs> because uh, when we have more and more renewables or volatile uh, uh, energy resources, so this will be the solution for many countries. Uh, we have in Switzerland, you, you mentioned it, there are pumping storage systems in the Alpine regions, but this is very expensive. So for the moment, nobody would invest in new pumping storage facilities because we can never compete with, with gas, we can never compete with uh, 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 well, over capacities we have. Uh, and yes, we've, we don't mention coal, I don't like coal. Sorry to say that. But uh, yeah, I think politically we cannot forbid a country, this technology is over. So I'm, I'm all, I feel also solidarity with those who have nothing but coal. So I think also here it's possible, maybe CCS, maybe other technology to reduce CO2 emissions. So I think we must have a pragmatic approach and uh, when you have these resources, okay, uh, that's here, but please find us solutions that is sustainable on a long way. And I think then we can also, with a growing population on the globe, uh, uh, feel well and uh, don't uh, uh, leave behind us a mess for the environment. So, uh, Councillor uh, Lothard has joined uh, up here at the, the front with um, Lino Gazella, who's the, the rector and president-elect of ETH and Alexander uh, Wacken, uh, who is the head of the General Energy <laughs> Research Department at uh, the Paul Scherer Institute uh, at ETH. So it's a pleasure to have those two up here as well and, and uh, to, to take part in the, the discussion. So I'll ask if either one of you would like to, to add to that last question or yeah, we can... Yes, perfectly. Okay. So, Susan. Uh, so um, <clears throat> I will raise perhaps some helpful questions. I share your... Uh, uh, antipathy toward coal, but I worry that in this post-Fukushima world where there is a fair amount of, I would say, hysteria around the safety of nuclear power, which over the last many decades has been extraordinarily reliable, extraordinarily sustainable, uh, extraordinarily beneficial in so many ways, uh, and yet countries uh, based on the experience of Fukushima, are fleeing from it, and the alternatives are not yet with us. So the question to you is, how do you bridge the gap from where we are today to where we want to be if you subtract nuclear from the <coughs> equation and you, you subtract coal from the equation? We, what, what are the alternative possibilities for providing for the energy needs that are not going to decrease as rapidly as we might hope? Well, the Swiss government is not against nuclear. We have five existing plants, but we decided not to, for the moment, for the next, I think, 30, 40 years, we don't uh, uh, have and construct new ones, because we have alternatives. But I, for, for China, I think it's impossible to have a, an energy supplier in their own country uh, without nuclear. So I think uh, every country in Australia think well about uh, fulfilling the energy supply and only to be dependent on imports. That's not a strategy for many countries. So therefore I think uh, uh, also here uh, Switzerland remains uh, uh, involved in uh, research. We have uh, also here if MIT in the fusion technology will be engaged, we have in Switzerland uh, also activities to improve uh, or develop uh, new generations in the nuclear industry. I think also here we, we have more an openness, but f for Switzerland in a heavily, densely populated uh, uh, country, difficult. And what changed after Fukushima are the costs. Uh, the costs for new nuclear plants with all the requirements for, for safety standards, uh, increased the cost per kilowatt hour uh, uh, remarkably. And another uh, worry I still see, what are we doing with the nuclear waste? So far we have only in Finland uh, one uh, disposal for nuclear waste. We in Switzerland are 
looking for a solution where we, we in, in, in Alpine Stones for 30 years, nobody from our citizens says, okay, fine by us, bring us this nuclear waste. There's a lot of resistance. So, and all these costs are not in every country calculated in the costs per kilowatt hour. So therefore I think, uh, um, I understand very well many countries who uh, remain on nuclear because they have no alternatives, because uh, it's green from a CO2 perspective. This was always a comparative advantage of nuclear and will remain a comparative advantage. And therefore, I think the price will uh, finally be decisive. If the renewables really have market prices without subsidies and feeding tariffs, which uh, are considerably uh, sustainable. And if you look at subsidies for the moment, fossil fuel subsidies are $540 billion. Last year for renewables, we've seen also subsidies, but it's 120 billion. So it's another world. And therefore, I'm not a fan of subsidies at all, but it's an existing model, and sometimes you have to be able to, to also push a technology. So therefore, I think, uh, uh, overall, when nuclear improves on, on the safety on, and when the waste question can be solved, introducing the costs in the consumer price, okay, why not? But for the moment, I don't see this uh, arriving. Fusion is telling us for many 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, I don't know. But as a politician, I can't rely on hope. I must install production. I must have kilowatt hours and not hope. If I may add to the second part of your question concerning the coal, then if you have global scenarios that combine growth and economic welfare with uh, ambitious CO2 reduction uh, targets, then in every scenario you see clean coal. And I think there are research opportunities there. So how to reduce the penalty in energy efficiency that you have if you add this carbon capture and sequestration? I've seen with pleasure that here the MIT has proposed new solutions to reduce that penalty. And I also see a great, uh, say, opportunity as we strive to make fracking environmentally compatible. We also learn about CO2 sequestration. So for the chemical engineers, there are great opportunities there, such that clean coal can play a role in this transition phase, certainly for 2050, until perhaps in the later half of this century, we can advance the renewables further for the whole planet. Maybe but, but, I want to add something as well. I mean, there is no easy way out of this situation. We all agree on that. So whatever we are going to do, it's going to be a hard choice. And hard choices are best addressed by having an informed opinion. An informed opinion, I have to say that here at MIT and also at ATIA, comes from fundamental and good research. So the most, the least intelligent thing we, we could do is start to prohibit people thinking about other solutions. And I would like to make an appeal here to everybody that whatever we do on the research side, on the basic research side, on the applied research side, we should be open to new ideas and not from the very beginning push aside some solution because of ideological or political or economical reasons that we might have. So I think uh, we uh, scholars, uh, students live in the best of all world. We are allowed to think whatever we want to. What then politics, policy realizes is another option. And of course, we have to accept many other constraints there. But I make, really would like to make an appeal here. We should not, in academia, put up thought barriers or thought uh, for both uh, prohibitions. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of nodding hands. Yeah. That's yeah. good. <laughs> Back here. Um, and it's, uh, it's also very inspiring that a lot of people here in the room are developing solutions. Um, 
this problem uh, every day. Um, and in that context, I have a question about um, energy efficiency in developing countries, specifically where to start. Um, let's take Nigeria, for example. Okay? Uh, they have a liquidity crisis right now in the power markets uh, because they can't collect revenues. And the reason for that is that over half of their customers aren't here. Um, as part of their rate base, they've already accounted for metering. Relatively aggressive. Uh, and if we think of smart meters, which have wireless capabilities for which the infrastructure exists, if you think of, say, Rwanda uh, building server farms for cloud management. Uh, I mean, that's relatively exciting, but then how, where to start? Where to, where to get some early wins to show that this actually works and that it's worth thinking about when people are, are always dealing with the next crisis um, and, and never really thinking a little bit more long term? Okay. <laughs> um, even in a rich country like, like Switzerland, we, we, we have a lot of discussions of, about metering and where we begin and if people really are, uh, are open to uh, smart meterings. We have so far made the experience that uh, when you are a big consumer, yes, it's, it's worth going in this direction and then you have a sensibility on the price and when you see, okay, I can, I can uh, uh, um, improve and it, it's also money wiser. Uh, I, I get a return. Uh, you're doing it, but in households, it's very difficult. In Switzerland, a normal household, two children, uh, has a, a yearly bill of electricity of of about thousand dollars, thousand one hundred. So. When I, I tell them, okay, you could save 10% uh, by buying new equipment or by metering and ch checking your behavior, okay, most of them tell, okay, 100 bucks, well, yeah. No, that, that, I think that that's uh, in industrial countries a, a big issue uh, 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 for, for the households. And I think in countries like Nigeria or in, in countries where you, you have an, another level of development, a lot of people can't pay electricity prices, neither water prices, so it's for free or it's subsidized. And then it's again, uh, the structure is not here for metering. We had one element in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan had, uh, since about two or three years, no metering, neither for electricity nor for water. Was everything for free? So it's clear that every household consumes, and when it's for free, how you save? Go to Saudi Arabia. Water is still for free, and electricity is available at low prices. The crude oil is also in the uh, production of electricity. So for those countries, it's enormous difficult to, to, to reduce the consumption, although yeah, it would be very intelligent and, and some kind of logic. And therefore, I think we should also encourage uh, those countries, even when perhaps you lose your job as a politician, but that's worth it. When you can, yeah, be more efficient. And I think here, a global approach is always very uh, important. And we made, uh, for example, in Rio Plus 20, we created this group of fossil fuel subsidies friends and help now Nigeria, Turkey, others who have to phase out subsidies from their system. Uh, how can they replace it that you don't have demonstrations at home, that also poor people don't suffer when they have higher prices? You see it for the moment in Egypt. Uh, where the, 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 the government decided, no, we, we, have, we have to do some economies on our budget, and it's the, uh, the, the fuel which uh, is now the victim. So it's the man of the street. They, they don't understand this. And I think here, uh, uh, when, you, when we have te technologies who brings down the consumption, for me, it's uh, much smarter than uh, pricing models in a world where the prices are so different and where we still have a lot of subsidies. May I uh, make a small spot here for one thing which is always a little bit pushed aside. Everybody talks about photovoltaics, about uh, solar to fuels, whatever. It's exciting, it's, the breakthroughs are there. But most important is efficiency improvements. Do the same with less energy input. It's not sexy. 
Uh, improving the, the efficiency of a gas turbine by 0.1% is maybe not a big achievement, you believe. But you save megawatt hours or gigawatt hours of, of CO2 equivalent over the years. So the key we have to address, the key issue is how to make our processes more efficient. And I never say that technology and science will be the only solution, but without better science and technology, there will be no solution. So again, my story ends here, my ad. Schools like MIT and the ATH play a crucial role in these future developments. Mm -hmm. The best thing that politics can do is invest money in education and in research. The return of investment of these two investments are fantastic. <laughs> 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 Let me try an answer to your question. You saw that in countries that didn't have a telephone network, uh, it was just passing to wireless communication. And therefore, I think Minister Leuthardt gave this vision of the worldwide energy web. And if, if we manage to make smart meters that are so small, so cheap, that they power themselves thermoelectrically, such that they can be attached directly to each device or each metering that you want to do and then transmit their data. This might be a pathway there where I could see that mass production of very cheap, very sensitive devices could help these countries. Just a little example. For three years, I'm now discussing with, for example, with Microsoft. We had in, uh, in, in, in the cell phones, you had from the beginning a chip where also an, in a standalone uh, uh, situ uh, yeah, stand uh, situ you have, you, you, you consume practically no uh, electricity. Standby. Standby, yes. Yeah. Uh, in, when, you, when you have your PC on, your laptop or other equipment also on your TVs, you don't have this chip inside. Costs you 20 cents, but there's no standard. There's no regulation. And so also here, I, sometimes I don't understand the industry. This would be very easy, but there's no regulation under. They, they don't do it by, I, would, I thought it could be a market model, <laughs> but it's not, it's not one. So I think also here technology can help us because there, afterwards when the consumer also sees a difference or has a, a similar price, but a, a better efficiency, I think this will make a lot of changes. Another example, in China you have 2,300 water dams and uh, they have old turbines. You could invest in new turbines and this would uh, uh, reduce energy consumption by 20%, very fast. But they have the philosophy, we construct new dams, we construct new hydropower facilities. So also to uh, improve the existing system, that's not sexy as well and nobody thinks about that or to, we don't think to, to uh, not, not enough on the existing infrastructure, existing uh, uh, equipment. And I think also here we have a uh, yeah, fantastic potential. So I think it's generally agreed that energy efficiency offers a really big opportunity for, for meeting projected energy demands in, in a lower carbon environment. Um, but, but a challenge with energy efficiency is, is how much do you expect uh, companies and people to take advantage of that uh, if there's not a price on carbon? And if you look at projections out to, to mid-century or, or beyond, in scenarios where you price carbon, in fact, people do harvest that, that energy efficiency opportunity. If you, if you force in renewables with an RPS, uh, generally energy demand doesn't go down so much, and, and in fact, energy efficiency doesn't play uh, so much. It's, so it's a challenge that's gonna need regulation, as you suggested, for example, with these chips to, to improve uh, efficiency or, or power consumption mm -hmm. in standby mode. Uh, but but it, it, it will probably take a, a price as well mm -hmm. um, to, to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Good science needs good politics. Yeah. Without yeah. that, it doesn't get an effect. Well, it certainly needs good R&D funding. I, I couldn't, could, couldn't agree more with you on that one. <laughs> uh, yes. My name is um, and actually, I've been looking at the, the history of uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs um, US energy budget. And if you look over history of the US energy budget, we're actually less efficient than we were a few years ago. 
about 60% of the energy that we produce is rejected energy according to Lawrence, according to Lawrence the moon. And so do we have an energy supply problem or do we have an energy use problem? However, my question is, or my comment is, most of what you talked about was electricity. You made some mention of mobility. Mm -hmm. But recently, I've been listening to uh, people from the Fraunhofer Institute and people from Germany talking about their energy mm -hmm. uh, systems. And I know also from friends who study the Danish system that a calorie is a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. It doesn't matter if it's electricity. It doesn't matter if it's heat. It doesn't matter if it's mobility. And we need to start thinking about energy across the board and mm -hmm. not just using electricity as, as what we talk about, as the subject of what we talk about when we talk about energy. We should be thinking in terms of second law economics and a calorie is a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. And that we should be thinking about energy as a system, mm -hmm. not just electricity here and mobility here and mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I'm also responsible for transport. And that's why we have no car industry in Switzerland, so we import cars. Uh, but you, you're right, we, we have also in the, in the uh, when it comes to energy, we have a, a, an efficiency plan also in transportation. We in, invest a lot in public transportation. Between, between in, in, in urban areas, railway is by far the most efficient uh, transport media. So we invest there, we have the densest railway system of the world. We transfer many goods also from road to rail because it makes sense when you have a certain distance. And we regulate by CO2 emissions for new cars coming on the market. And because in Switzerland you have about every 12, 13 years a new fleet. So we have also here a driving element uh, which reduces energy consumption and CO2 emissions. So this is for us uh, part of the plan. And the same thing is in the construction business, in buildings, here by building standards, uh, but also because we have for uh, uh, old existing uh, uh, buildings a refurbishment program, also here with in fiscal incentives that the owner renovates or after that he has a knowledge where his energy standard is from the existing house. Also here we give fiscal incentives that they renovate the house and here the potential is for us clear and since 2008 we are also making progress. But we don't urge anybody. It's, it's an offer and it works. And also I have to remind you that the gallon of gas in Switzerland costs $8. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the system view on energy, and that's extremely important. And the strategy that Minister Leuthard is implementing has this element, because you also mentioned the second law of thermodynamics, that electricity, of course, has a different value. But having this option to switch between electricity, thermal energy, and chemical energy storage, and then uh, Storing, therefore, energy that is produced when uh, renewables are available plentifully, that is extremely important. And making this flexibility in both directions possible, that will be one of the key answers that we have to come up with solutions. Up in the back? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate very much your, your uh, presentation. I'm glad to speak to you. My question to you refers to not only the technological part, but a different segment of the Switzerland, uh, let's say, life. Uh, the financial sector is extremely strong. So my question to you is whether or not there is a concerned policy of not financing um, the construction of coal-fired plants elsewhere in the world, and also financing the production of equipment that would power this and, and would uh, uh, be used in this class. 
Uh, we have uh, several uh, multilaterals and among them also two uh, uh, banks which are in the UN program uh, where you have to behave uh, 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 with sustainable uh, uh, projects and services. So therefore, uh, some are doing it, but we have not a interdiction. Or, uh, it's allowed also to finance coal or fossil fuel or, or, uh, equipments. And uh, therefore, I think it's difficult to tell from a government what is good, what is bad, what is allowed, what is forbidden. But uh, I think uh, codes of conduct is the right way that companies also decide. That's part of my philosophy. And we are always doing actually the, the, the opposite. We, 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 we try that they go in green credits, that they go in sustainable products. And here in Geneva, we have for, for the moment the largest center for sustainable financing. So they go in this direction, but it's more an intensive, incentivized system than a system with uh, interdictions. And I think that's not a solution for a liberal world. But you're right, uh, that's, this could also help uh, uh, yeah, to, to reduce CO2 emissions. Let me switch sides here. So the U.S. certainly needs a good community awareness, citizen engagement, set of campaigns to get the public to buy into a lot of the issues that the general public on a day-to-day -day level don't think about, which means we need creative ways to engage them. But I'm wondering, in Switzerland, it doesn't seem like, it seems like everybody's on board in Switzerland. Everybody knows what you know, perhaps, because it is a smaller country and people are more find the need or do you have any kind of you know radio television ads and community awareness kind of campaigns to get the wider public invested? Oh I, I would I would be happy if everybody would be in line. <laughs> no, no, but I think what, what you say, information is, is very important. For example, we have from, from my ministry programs with schools, with children, uh, for one week, they are climate pioneers. So they have projects uh, and we invite them, a uh, couple of thousand kids to burn in the capital and the best among them get an award. So. Um, education, but also uh, uh, with concrete projects. Uh, we have, uh, together with the industry, uh, uh, on internet, uh, created a labeling system. Labels where you see the energy efficiency for the consumer, very, very, very uh, transparent, for, from the tire to the car to the uh, uh, wash machine, or so every, 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 everything, and we, we enlarge the system of labeling. And also retailers go in this direction that you see on the product you buy in the, in, 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 in the shop, or also the, the sustainability or the, or the carbon footprint. So I think, uh, uh, yes, it's, it's, I think it takes time, but information and visibility is, is very important. And I, uh, I think young people are today, it's hip, to be uh, CO2 friendly today. It's hip to share the car and not to buy your own car. We have a lot of young people and people, they don't go anymore for the driver's permit. They prefer uh, railway because they think, oh, it's there I can work, I have access to internet, I save time, or I'm uh, with my friends. Uh, so, so I think this is also a change of behavior for the next generation, which could help us. Therefore, IT and all this gadget for me is part of the solution. So one question back here in the back. Uh, thank you. My apologies, a little bit late. Uh, I noticed on your chart you say economic efficiency. I'd like to point out that just looking at carbon and uh, CO2 uh, outputs and so forth often misses the point about what those are used for. In a Western economy, there's greater efficiency per unit of fuel than some other places. Uh, so some of the kind of uh, feel-good, um, handmade movement that people are looking for, for their clothing and whatnot, uh, obviates the fact that, that in a place where you use a donkey to gather um, goods and so forth and bring them to market, has, has much greater inefficiency and CO2 production that's not really measured, given that the donkey is not taking, you know, uh, given amounts of gasoline that are measured and purchased and taxed and so forth. 
So a donkey's living and breathing all day, all night, and so forth. A, a much more efficient thing would, for the guy to be on a motorcycle or a car or something. And, and engines have their place. The combustion engines have their place, and they're very efficient because the, 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 the idea is not the carbon per se or the use of that thing. It's really the output. So the real question is what's the, the numerator, what's the denominator? Those vary place to place. And in the Western economies, they tend to be much more efficient. And even though our carbon footprint is, is, is larger, we're standing on bigger feet. Yes, that's why we think you should uh, uh, have higher prices for gasoline, for example. <laughs> I don't know, it's politically not feasible, but actually uh, it's too cheap, much too cheap. I think you're missing my point, which is that, in fact, places where the, the gasoline is used in greater amounts are mm -hmm. places where our products are made more efficiently. And so the places that wind up having inefficiency and perhaps not receiving those goods made from the Western mm -hmm. places where things are made more efficiently with those combustible uh, fuels. But I have to, and this is a funny anecdote, I have to always to tell in discussion like that. You know, in 1900, Switzerland started becoming electrified, and I once met a guy who had the history or archives of these first utilities, and he told me, you know how much a kilowatt hour cost at 1900 in Switzerland? I said, no, 20 Swiss cents. Uh, let's assume it's 20 dollar cents, it uh, doesn't matter. Uh, today, today, the price of a kilowatt hour in Switzerland is in the order of magnitude of 20 cents. So the price of electricity over 100 years has remained the same. The only difference is that a worker had a wage for, for an hour of 20 cents in 1900. And nowadays, I'm sure you know the better the figures, it will be around 20 Six. Swiss francs or something like that. So we had a factor of 100 increase on the purchase power, but the cost of electricity remained the same. And it's clear that if you have this glut, if you have this free availability of, of working capability, huh, that's what electricity is, that you use it. You use it maybe not in a very intelligent way. So we have to work on two sides, on the efficiency, on the supply side, but there is no way around that we also have to work on the sufficiency side. We have uh, to become more sensible. As you are well aware, these goals work together, right? We have energy per GDP. This is one of the indicators. And then the CO2 intensity of energy. And if we combine these goals of reducing, say, uh, absolute energy demand by increasing the energy efficiency of our production and at the same time decarbonizing, then these will go nicely hand in hand. And I think if you look for a metrics, I would uh, usually take these two and combine them and see whether we can advance both of them. Because if you, as you say correctly, if we start to walk, we will not be using gasoline, but we might not get that far. So I'd like to ask a, a final question, looking at um, uh, infrastructure and, and energy system, uh, not in Switzerland, but maybe uh, European-wide. Um, Switzerland, you point out, has a lot of, of excellent hydro resource, uh, but no fossil fuels. Uh, Germany uh, has a lot of uh, solar now, uh, but intermittent, uh, which might match up well with your storage. Uh, France has a lot of nuclear. You're not going to build nuclear, but there's a vast amount of nuclear uh, next door. Um, Italy has gas. Um, question is what, what, whether or not there is, uh, what, what do you see are the challenges in developing a European energy system? Uh, what infrastructure needs would there be to make that work? And what are the hurdles to, to making that happen? Well, we will, we will have, uh, from the 1st January 2015, an integrated European energy market. Actually, it's electricity again, but uh, they, they say it's an energy market. And you're right, we have totally different sources of energy with other um, uh, issues for the grid especially. And uh, I think, yes, what, what is not really uh, uh, developed uh, according to these different sources of uh, electricity is really the grid. The grid is for me the, the biggest concern because, uh, yes, to have the stability in the grid with these different uh, volatile resources coming in the grid at any time, even at time when you have enough electricity, 
this is a, a, a big concern for us. We had last year situations when you had, a, because in Germany you have a, the, the guarantee that your renewable uh, electricity has to be fed in by the uh, uh, utilities. So we had negative tariffs. Uh, and that's actually crazy. Yeah. And Switzerland, we try a little bit that we can keep the balance with our hydropower, but uh, it's uh, very difficult. And therefore, well, there is a plan of the supergrids bringing from the Northern Sea the wind power to, to the south. And also we uh, work on reverse uh, grid technology that we can bring from Italy, the gas to the north. And so it needs a totally different architecture and re requires huge investments in the grid. And therefore, in Switzerland and in most European countries, the costs for the grid are already 40% of the end consumer price. And I think there we see a development there which will bring us increased prices for the grid, but we will have uh, uh, reduced production prices. Uh, this will be very interesting, therefore, for Switzerland it's also clear the grid is very decisive, and the grid again, together with IT, IT technologies, you can uh, steer it, you can talk with the big consumers uh, when you need uh, uh, your electricity, and therefore we are also very happy with the researchers in this a field, uh, uh, and together with the storage capacities, I think these will be the biggest issues in an integrated electricity market of tomorrow. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to thank our, our uh, uh, colloquium speaker one more time. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Good evening.